Hey guys, a lot of you have asked me whether or not I play Kerbal Space Program. Well, I do, albeit not very well, but I thought that I'd do a little bit of a crossover between KSP and Vintage Space and do some vintage missions in Kerbal Space Program while I also learn how to play the game. So today on Amy Tries to Kerbal, we're looking at the Albert Rhesus Monkeys. All right, for those of you guys who don't know Kerbal Space Program, it is a computer game where you build and design your own rockets and spacecraft and fly them on missions through a solar system that is like our own, but not quite our own. But we're not going off the Earth, which in this case is Kerbin. We're not leaving Kerbin today because we're talking about the Albert Rhesus Monkey launches, which only involved V2 rockets. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history of the rocket while we build one. So a little bit of a historical backstory before we get started. The V2 was the German Army's rocket of the Second World War. It was the rocket they launched on European cities, namely London, at the end of the war to try to win it for Germany. Um, but it kind of came too late in the war, which was good for the Allies. But it was still nonetheless one of those technologies that both the Soviets and the Americans, the Allies and the Axis powers, were really keen to understand and start to develop into their own own weapons for future wars. Werner von Braun knew that he, he wanted to build rockets for spaceflight eventually um, and wanted to surrender to the United States as opposed to the Soviet Union because the US had the best chance for him actually building the rockets as opposed to using them as weapons. Um, so he hid tons and tons of documents in the Harz Mountains. He escaped Nazi Germany, surrendered to the, to, the, to the American army, recovered all those documents from the Harz Mountains, and everything was transferred over to the White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico in 1946. And I will say that is the ultimate short form of the story. There's a lot more to it. But when these V2 parts arrived in hundreds of train cars in, in the New Mexico desert, um, only two full V2s could be made. The rest had to be sort of um, understood by the American engineers and then rebuilt and, and refurbished so but they were all the the point of the v2 um bringing the v2 into the united states was actually for a project called project project hermes and it was the american project to understand the v2 and eventually develop american missile offshoots from v2 technology eight of these v2s were made slightly longer and called the blossom rocket and these were earmarked for biological testing they flew um fruit flies and corn seeds planted the corn seeds afterwards to see if there was any effect of radiation on their growth but this was a really poor analog for human testing which is what the air force and uh, cambridge medical lab scientists who were behind the, the biological testing really wanted to find out so they eventually progressed to uh, rhesus monkeys, um, and these were the Albert monkeys. So let's build our spacecraft here. We're gonna start with just the simple uh, one, one man pod because we only had one Albert monkey in there. Um, we're gonna put on, where's my parachute? Uh, parachute so that it comes down safely. We're gonna use a decoupler because we don't need the entire rocket to come down because the blossoms were actually among the first V2s where only the pod or the, the sort of capsule would come down as opposed to the whole rocket. And the V2 was a really simple, single-stage rocket. It was powered by a mix of um, alcohol and liquid oxygen. The alcohol was a mixture of 75% ethyl alcohol and water, 25% water. So we're just going to use one uh, one fuel tank because it also didn't need to go, the v these V2s didn't go very high. Um, the thrust of the V2 was about 55,000 pounds at launch, um, which increased to about 160,000 pounds of thrust at maximum speed. And these things only ever got to a, a roughly, without sort of additions, um, about 60 miles so we don't need to go very high either. So we're just gonna do the medium sized fuel tank. Um, and I'm gonna use the swivel engine because I kinda like how it gives you a little bit more control in flight uh, in this game. So the other thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna add fins um, because the V2 was powered by, um, it had an internal gyroscope, but it also had these um, fins and vanes on the outside to help steering. And there were four of them, so we're gonna stick four on. And just a little side note, um, uh, Jim Lovell at an Apollo 13 anniversary event I went to a few months ago mentioned that uh, fins were Werner von Braun's trademark. So here, here's our little V2 stand-in. Obviously the V2 didn't quite look like this, but you know what, we're gonna go with it. All right, so here is our Albert rocket sitting on the launch pad and we're actually gonna try to shoot uh, slightly north um, for this launch because the, the White Sands Proving Ground 
now White Sands Missile Range is, of course, landlocked in New Mexico. Uh, these rockets were not landing in the ocean, so I'll show you the, um, for those of you, again, unfamiliar with the game, um, this is our launch point. So we're right on the coast, just like Florida. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna try to go just slightly north um, so that we land on land like the Alberts actually did. All right, so the first V2 to launch a rhesus monkey named Albert was launched on June 11th of 1948. Um, the rocket didn't work perfectly well. Um, this Albert reached a peak altitude of 39 miles before the ascent was cut off by a failed valve inside the rocket. Um, it didn't explode, however, the capsule, the parachute failed. So if Albert survived any part of the launch at all, he did not survive the landing, but he probably didn't survive it to the rocket's apogee. Telemetry from, from the rocket during the flight, there were uh, telemetry sensors and biomedical sensors on, on the monkey, um, said that he probably succumbed to breathing problems inside the cramped cabin before launch, um, and likely died before he hit the ground, which was good because he would have hit the ground with a frightening amount of power. The second, the second Albert monkey to launch was also named Albert. It was named for the same monkey. Uh, this launched on June 14th of 1949, and he did slightly better. Uh, so Albert II did slightly better than Albert I, um, but not, not really by much. He did survive launch, and he reached an apogee of 83 miles, but didn't survive the landing. Like Albert I's flight, uh, Albert II's parachute failed, so he hit the desert floor full force with nothing to slow him down. Um, but at least on this flight, it, telemetry did say that the monkey was more or less conscious and did, did survive uh, the flight, which again, he died, but it was more promising for the humans running the test that he actually survived and that the, the uh, cabin, the pressure's cabin he was in, was able to support a, a life on a flight. Uh, the third, the third Albert was uh, launched on September 16th of 1949 and he was unfortunately killed almost instantly after a flight, or after a launch rather. Um, this V2 missile, number 32 if you're keeping score, uh, suffered a tail explosion 10.7 seconds after liftoff and the rocket was destroyed just three miles above the launch pad and of course that took Albert with it. And the last Albert, Albert IV, was launched on uh, December 8th of 1949 to a peak altitude of 79 miles. Um, sensors said that the biomedical data was good throughout the flight, but the monkey was again killed when the parachute failed um, during, during landing. He hit the desert floor again without anything to sort of slow down the launch. And I should just say, I'm not paying attention to what my actual apogee is. I'm not trying to make an analog for the actual height of an average Albert flight for Kerbin. So we're just, we're just going to go with... Uh, we're just gonna go with the rough trajectory, which is basically a ballistic trajectory. So even though none of the Alberts actually survived their flights, it was a success in terms of, um, the Albert flights showed that there was a way for a biological specimen to survive a launch and a landing on a rocket. Um, and it really, the story kind of interestingly speaks to the immaturity of rocketry in sort of this early phase when, when human testing was, was in the future, but not quite there yet. But clearly people were already thinking about what to do to get men into space. So it didn't work. The Alberts didn't work. But the test that they brought back and the, the data that they sent back said that it was something that could possibly be feasible. And really in the 1940s, this was sort of enough. Um, if they had all you know, succumbed to radiation poisoning or something, this would have been very different. But surviving, surviving the launches and surviving the flights, but succumbing to technical issues meant that the, the hurdles were technical, not, not biological, biomedical. So um, as we know, this was sort of one of, the first, one of the first instances of really looking into what might happen for a man going into space. All right, so <laughs> we survived on land, like the Alberts, and let's see if I can get him off. <laughs> All right, I don't know if I can make Jeb wave exactly, but I hope you guys enjoyed my foray into Kerbal Space Program. Leave your questions and comments about the Albert monkeys or early biomedical testing in the comment section below, and I will answer as many as I can. Um, for daily Vintage Space updates, be sure to follow me on Twitter at AST Vintage Space, and with episodes going up most Tuesdays and Fridays, and for more videos where I narrate my attempts to play Kerbal with historical uh, missions, definitely subscribe right here so you never miss an episode. Thank you.